Welcome, uh, Mr. Joe Cornish. It's a pleasure to have you on the show. Great to be here, Alistair. Thank you. You're welcome. You're welcome. Now, um, you're someone I've been wanting to speak to for, uh, is a generation a long time? Is that, is that too long? <laughs> um, I, whenever I write, whenever I write, sorry, whenever I write at the moment, I always find myself saying, well, it's, you know, it's literally 40 years since I've been in the business. So probably two generations, maybe. Yeah, possibly. Well, that's right. I've, I've been making photographs for 20 years and, and, and I feel like a youth now. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, I'm, I'm really looking forward to this. Um, now, uh, you've mentioned already 40 years you've been making photographs as a professional photographer. Um, why do you make photographs? <laughs> good, it's a very good question. Uh, <laughs> I suppose it is an obsession in a way. Um, but uh, I mean, in some ways, my my background is quite simple. In in that, I I think I had was had one real skill at school, which was drawing. Um, okay. it, it came naturally. It's something I loved to do, and I was never particularly academic. Um, and although you know, I did okay in exams, but and eventually ended up at university. But that was to study fine art, which isn't really a particularly academic subject. So right. uh, that's my background was was really, uh, in a way, um, focused towards becoming an artist, professional or otherwise. Um, and when I was at uni, uh, the, I started using a camera and almost literally from day one, it, it became an obsession. I just, I love it. I love that way of making it. It's like drawing, but quickly. Yes, um, yes. If, if, if you like. Uh, and also the fact that uh, that then as a poor student, it was everything was black and white to so roll your own film and process your own, own film and, and make your own prints, you know, usually with cheap, everything very cheaply. Um, but but working with black and white was also a good a good basis because it made that that link, that connection with with the scene world, uh, with observation, drawing everything is drawing it's it's looking and translating the visual world i mean i'm trying to articulate it now but of course at the time you, you don't necessarily think those things you're just trying to do what you do right right uh, right so it, this this obsession has to have a root i, I guess uh, now anyone who's watched any vision and light episodes knows that i, I i'm very much of a psychiatrist's couch type of interviewer uh, <laughs> so th that's what i'm because i only have these conversations because i'm interested to know myself and we just happen to share them with with other people um so the anything that anything that causes that sort of obsession or or, or desire um is it to compensate for uh, other deficiencies of articulation? Do you do you struggle to articulate emotion and feelings through words or through actions, or is that the the purpose of photography? Is it allows you to express things that may be awkward or difficult otherwise? I, th I think so now, uh, you know, because I can articulate it looking back over uh, over over a lifetime. Um, but saying that, I, I, I never really had problems with words. Uh, I, the one other subject I was good at uh, as a kid was English. Right. Um, so writing and so on came relatively easily as well. In fact, I studied English at, at uni the, in my first year, okay. as well as, as part of a, um, a kind of blended course. Um, and, the, and the department asked me to continue with it, but uh, I wanted to do art. Um, so I, I think that's, Actually, it's more to do with another psychological flaw or weakness, let's say, which was chronic shyness. Okay. And uh, I, and also because I was quite deaf when I was young too. Ah. Um, and I, I do think now in retrospect that a, a large part of the reason that my uh, visual kind of uh, skills are fairly well honed is that unbeknownst to me, I became dependent on them. Wow because my hearing was quite poor. Um, I found it really difficult to deal with any kind of group social interactions because I couldn't hear what people were saying. Right. Everything became became a blur. One-to-one, -one, no problem. Um, so you can see that um, that is the basis for, for becoming very socially um, 
uh, nervous, uh, uh, unconfident, and so on. And so um, at the same time, I was always happy outdoors, playing, um, cycling, running, walking, jumping around on rocks um, yep. down by the sea. I had, I had three siblings, so we had, uh, it's a happy childhood on the whole, but it was for me always overshadowed by my, uh, my shyness. Right. Um, and and actually, in many ways, photography, which is especially landscape photography, seems quite a uh, a solitary occupation. Being outdoors, looking at the world, trying to translate it, trying to understand it, and of course, as as I now realise, trying to uh, make emotional sense of it. Um, what what does love and joy mean to you? Mm -hmm. um, and and the landscape for me, you know, the habitat, the the world of plants, animals, mountains, rocks, rivers, streams, um, you know, and the, the restlessness of, of light, you know, is a, is a source of joy. Um, not something I probably would or could have said when I was younger, but I realize that that's the case now. And that hasn't really changed. That's wonderful. I, I, like I said, I get so much pleasure out of these because I think for me, photography is a reflective medium. And in a way, there's nothing better to reflect upon than something that represents an experience that you've had or a time of your life or a moment where you're engaged with, like you say, lights or subjects or textures or, or transitions or whatever it may be. Do you feel that then photography has uh, acted not just as a metaphor for those events in their own right, but has allowed part of that reflection as to previous actions and almost like your personal development has your photography almost sort of been like a diary of your progress from shy uh, uh, chronically shy through to a more confident uh, self-actualized human yes sir, i think so um you've expressed it very well uh, i would i would Put it exactly that way perhaps um not quite so articulately but i, <laughs> I, I think that uh, i think what photography did was it, it gave it gave me um a sense of well the modern word is agency I, I, an ability to a competence and ability to express myself but also to put food on the table um as, mm. as i moved in you know away from uni and, and started having to earn a living um and and that because I, I did have this ability to draw. So in a way, the, the uh, photographic skills came very, very easily, visual, visually. And although the technology, you know, it does have its com complications, it, it's always been a, a manageable technology for me. Mm. I don't necessarily know the deep science of it that well, but I know how the camera works and understand, I think now, particularly how um, you know, the utilization of the different tools within the camera. And then of course, the post-production side, which is equally important, um, how that translates in the visual realm and what that means in terms of our emotional response to pictures uh, and, and the way that photographer draws them. And, you know, I use the, the term draw advisedly there. Uh, so yes, I think from a psychological, to return to the, the psychological question, uh, the, the competence and confidence um, were, but you could say it's a, a form of, of actualization. Mm -hmm. But what, what, what I would say, though, in retrospect now, looking at it, is, is if I look back on my career, which is, you know, is a, is a, as I said earlier, 40 years long, there's a kind of transition phase in the middle, uh, which coincides uh, uh, with changes in approach to equipment, um, towards what my kind of financial imperatives were as well, um, progress of family life uh, and doing more and more teaching uh, right. and workshop yeah. leading. So you see, you know, from uh, as a younger photographer, I'm, I'm trying to make, make a living uh, and, and at the same time do the work I love um, and, and, uh, and to have a, a good life. Uh, but I think the work reflects what you might call more commercial imperatives. Yeah. And, and so, you know, how do you make your work distinct, different, impactful, and so on. And then over the last uh, 20 years, but especially the last 10, it's become more, um, more uh, quiet, probably, um, more uh, directly about how I feel in relation uh, to 
nature and to my own experience as opposed to fulfilling a brief or maybe trying to uh, exceed a brief right and, uh, it still exists i still do occasionally uh, commercial work but it's not commercial commercial it tends to be books yeah 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 we might come on to that at some point um yeah I, I i'm trying to do my first uh so it's i'm speaking to a designer this afternoon in fact so it's it's my first foray into putting yeah. putting my soul on the line and and uh making no money from it <laughs> Just as well to think that. <laughs> yes, think that. yes. I've been speaking to Bruce Percy about it, and uh, I'm under no illusions. <laughs> um, you, you, the way these conversations tend to go is that during your uh, speaking, I kind of pick up on little bits that you say, and uh, any direction that I think I might have in my mind to go next to, to, can get hijacked, and I tend to go off in tangents and so forth. Um, I'm very interested in uh, the differences the differences between drawing and photography. Now, if you were to go into a landscape uh, with a pen and paper, you obviously have uh, creative choices uh, in terms of well, you know that rock is there, but it might look a little bit better if it was over there, etc. Uh, and photography has moved in that direction somewhat. There are people who construct landscapes uh, in Photoshop out of constituent parts. Um, how important to you is the integrity of the scene that's in front of you when, when you're in the, in the field? It's very important. Um, in fact, I, uh, and by the way, let me preempt this by saying that I make no judgment about the decisions other people make. I, I think no, it is. Nor, nor do I. Nor right, do it's, I. A, it's a creative process. But for me, the eyewitness tradition really, really does matter. And uh, now it's not to say I don't know the tools that are available to make changes. I do. And um, it would be wrong to say I've never added a sky to another picture because I have done it once just right. recently. But uh, I might even explain the background to that. But on the whole, I don't do it um, because I love the fact that one of the inherent limitations or uh, strengths of photography is is that you you had that encounter and you, you're for me I'm trying to um, to produce something that for me is an honest and truthful translation it is still a translation though yes it's a two-dimensional language after all um, of of the of the experience uh, it, it's it's um, it's a arbitrary it's an arbitrary one in a way you could say because after all where where is I mean you know all experienced photographers must have had to wrestle in the uh, digital era with the question of well do I change something which I, I could change to make a better picture um, and when I mean, it comes up for frequently um, mm. so uh, I find it helpful to have a philosophical attachment to uh, the original um, experience in that sense. So, I, I, you know, I'll, um, while we will, we can get deeper into it. But uh, so, for example, if there is a, a power line or a pylon or, um, you know, a, any kind of man made ob objects in what would otherwise be a beautiful natural landscape, do I leave them there? Yes, I do. That, that's the general principle. If there is a white van in a very far distance, rather than, you know, knock it out, I might uh, take contrast down locally around it. It's still there, but it's it's not dominating. It's diminished. Anymore. Diminished to the point where, it, so in a way, it's a reminder it, that this, this isn't, you know, it's not meant to be a pastoral paradise or something like that or... A, uh, natural, you know, it, anywhere in the UK, as you know, um, you know, even into the deepest glens in, in Scotland, um, it, it, there's usually a bothy or a, uh, you know, a, a stalker's hut or a track or, mm. you know, in a very far distance, you'll see some wind turbines now, <laughs> yes, particularly. Yes. Um, and, and, and these are the reality. So to me, the, this is not, uh, it, it's not meant to be escapism. It is meant to be reality. Okay. That, that the beauty of experience, that the human experience uh, is to face the truth. You know, it's to be honest with ourselves about 
where we are and what we live and to find the redemption that there is there but also to to understand you know as, a, as an eyewitness photographer I, I can also tackle scenes of devastation and dereliction and um and despair and that, that that's something that I should tackle Oh, you're 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 poking a bunch of buttons here. First of all, that quote is going on my whiteboard in my office. Uh, that that, that was a, that's a good line. I, I need to remember that one. Um, now, uh, aesthetics is something I'm super super interested in because I think there's an emotional relationship with the aesthetic in the same way that musically we have uh, an emotional relationship with sound you know harmony dissonance we know a bad chord when we hear a bad chord uh, the devil's chord as as they, they used to call it in in <laughs> rock music um this this aesthetic I think my my concern is that landscape photography, how it was taught perhaps traditionally, was a template model where it was, you know, bottom left, top right, diagonal, leading lines, uh, strong subject, complementary subject, some form of juxtaposition, and everything was kind of templated out, which I think leads to a, a harmonious aesthetic. It's an accessible aesthetic. Uh, looking through your galleries, there's innumerable cases where you're making photographs that completely abandon any form of what I would call template style composition. Um, now, I've, I've got about so many questions in my mind here. Uh, the emotional relationship to the aesthetic, you've talked about um, devastation, you've talked about emotional um, uh, diversity, I suppose, in yourself and the way that the landscape is speaking to you. What, have, what has been your discovery of different aesthetic versus different emotional responses? Is that something that's very much in your mind as you're creating your work? Well, it certainly is a deep question. Um, I think that, that there's a well, one one thing I I, I do believe, and, and maybe this is an article of faith. But in order to make work that can that that, for, that I want to make, and which I think will touch mm -hmm. others, um, there is an idea of beauty that remains true regardless of the. Um, of the sentiment or the emotion that underlies the approach. So, I mean, I think uh, if I can take another photographer as an example, Edward Bertinsky, whose work I think will be familiar to most of your uh, audience, Alistair, um, great Canadian environmental photographer. His work illustrates things that uh, very deliberately focus on uh, destruction and, and uh, what you might call negative that tend to be uh, let's say pollution sometimes mm -hmm. uh, a lot of his aerial work deals with that um, with uh, with mountainsides that have been chewed up by quarrying of course sometimes these quarries are fantastically beautiful mm -hmm. um, and the, the the patterns made by pollution can still convey harmonies uh, right. rhythms, color relationships and textures that are fascinating. And that makes to me the beauty or the, the understanding of pattern relationship that governs the way the picture is structured, the understanding of color, texture, light um, and, uh, and depth. All of these make the picture demand a response mm -hmm. from the viewer. You don't just pass them by and think you've got better things to do with your time. So I think that that's an important uh, function of, of, the art, of the artist to find a way of expressing the inexpressible uh, through um, their, their sense. And it is an aesthetic, probably, sense of, of pattern, but how to, there is beauty. Francis Bacon's um, paintings of, of the kind of fallen human, uh, as man, as beast, as it were, they're, they're appalling in many ways, um, but they're very beautiful. And that, that is, to me, that helps you to understand a different kind of beauty, which is one of the ways, one of the reasons that I think it's very important to, to try to remain true as an eyewitness photographer to what we see and to accept that things are not perfect. 
you know, perfection is not the goal. And uh, it's a difficult one because, you know, you're, you might say, well, you know, you're constantly striving to make improvements, to, to develop your eye and refine your ideas, but it isn't about perfection. It's about depth. And, and to continue to probe and interrogate what you're looking at, to understand the relationships within it. Um, so I think that uh, you know, when, you, when you tackle all different kinds of subjects, for me, the, the notion of, a, of, of beauty, which is not something that you can formulate, you, you mentioned formats and templates, um, they, they are useful as a, as a recognition of pattern um in in the sort of as you develop as an artist but but it's very very important to realize that they're only they're only a kind of foundation course um you have to go beyond that that's a fascinating answer that that's 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 eight minutes of of uh, of photographic gold you've just managed to pour out of your thank you but i mean i think it is it's, it's a referencing of of other other art forms is actually really really helpful in that regard i mean as a musician yourself you know you will understand you know once you've gone beyond playing the chords and understanding the fundamentals of rhythm there's so so much more um to to kind of communicating the inner life um you know which i think ultimately is what artists would like to do it's a very difficult thing to do with photography because in a way what we're dealing with has this sort of veneer of the machine Mm -hmm. you know, that the the camera itself does the descriptive work, the heavy lifting, as it were, optically, and we lack the kind of maker's mark, but we still have it in a different way. Yeah, you know? and it, it's learning how to translate perspective, viewpoint, um, understanding the content, and so forth. I can't wait till COVID's over and we get to go and hang out in Glencoe. <laughs> <laughs> that should be fun. Um, I, th this is one of those conversations that could go on for hours and hours and hours. Uh, something I'm interested in is uh, how much of this emotional uh, insight into each photograph uh, is intuitive and is happening in the field on a subconscious level versus stuff that you contemplate later when you're sat in front of the computer perhaps or even when it's a final print and you mm. get to have that uh, somewhat more objective relationship with the content uh, do you think there's too much subjectivity uh, in incorporated into photography uh, and it makes it difficult for us to detach um, so I, I'm interested with your relationship in terms of how much of it do you feel is intuitive when you're in the field? I presume you don't go looking for compositions. I would imagine that you're the type of person who recognizes relationships and points your camera at those, but do correct me if I'm wrong. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you. Um, I think, I think it, it probably, I would say it is intuitive to a large extent. Uh, it was, it, it was interesting earlier hearing you describe um, you know, the teaching of landscape photography, because that's something I never personally experienced. I've no. always sort of taught myself um, when I was a student. Um, I, the, well, all, all my all my friends were doing something other than photography. Um, and I, I really started taking pictures, just walking out in, into uh, the parks or the riverside uh, at Reading, where I was at uni. I was going um, to ask where you were. Where you yeah. Were. And just looking at, at, at the shapes of trees, honestly, that, that's how I started for, as a landscape photographer, was looking at trees. I'm still looking at trees <laughs> 40, <laughs> 45 years later. Um, so, yeah, uh, it's so I think that uh, I, I do feel that, that there's, uh, I, I mean, I'm not an academic on aesthetics, by the way, but I think uh, intuitively you feel a composition has a, has a life force. You know, I, I can't put it more um, succinctly than that. And, and that it's the relationships within the composition. So, I, I mean, I'm articulating that now. And certainly when I, I look at pictures on the computer and, and think about them and turn them upside down, trying to figure out how they work mm. um, and, and then making adjustments and so on. Um, I'm doing a lot of intellectualizing at that point. But I do think that out in the field, uh, the, the, the visualization process, it's it is is very natural it comes from a 
from yeah, your lifetime of, of making pictures. Um, and I think that's, that, that, is, that, that does connect you know, to the pictures that I drew when I was a child. Uh, and and you know, thinking ab about, I mean, human figure, by the way, I don't know if you'd agree with this, but I think the human figure and the human face, if, in my understanding of it is correct, still form the basis of, of our aesthetic ideas. And, and they, in a sense, they're the first pattern that we recognize. Yeah. And, and, and so, you know, the pattern of this, this sort of singular living force, you know, with symmetry, you know, two eyes, you know, nose, mouth, you know, we, we have two legs, two arms and so on. You know, we have some, one of some things and two, and two of another, but there's a symmetry. So if you think of composition, there's a symmetry, but we also recognize everybody's asymmetrical mm -hmm. in one way or another. Um, you know, the, sometimes it's said, you know, the most beautiful uh, fashion models have got very symmetrical features and faces, but even they, you know, a, are asymmetrical. Asymmetry, symmetry, asymmetry is one of my little kind of compositional devices, you could right. say, because I think that everybody understands it, recognizes it and uses it. Um, from time to time, whether they recognize it in that way. Um, which, of course, doesn't mean that all compositions are a single thing in the middle of the picture. No. You know, that, that would be absurd, but it is a, um, it's a starting point. Uh, I, wonder if that, I, wonder if that, I wonder if that um, explains partly our obsession with reflections. Uh, that you know that that symmetry, and of course, as soon as you flip them ninety degrees, you've got faces, and and we sort of see faces in in, yes. in reflections all the time with diagonals and and so forth. Uh, yeah, there must be something in that. I, th I think I think that that pattern um, patterns repetition and uh, and the human figure re represent a sort of basis for for composition and and, um, and I uh, for personally for me I uh, my other kind of thought process if there is one and, and again I'd say it's more intuitive in the field when I'm using the camera I've always used to say I'm not clever enough to be able to think all these things and use the camera at the same time <laughs> and whether it's that or not I don't know but um, when I'm using the camera I'm yeah I'm f I feel my way into the viewpoint so I, I, I don't know about you but when I'm because I almost invariably use a tripod. I, I like to use a tripod. It's it, for me. It's part of the the process. Uh, I tend to use either my phone or a viewer, mm -hmm. uh, a Linhof uh, multi finder, uh, to to find my viewpoint. And I do ninety percent of the visualization work is done in the hand with oh, no right. tripod, no camera. Mm -hmm. And it's only once I know where exactly where I want to be. It is then that I set the tripod up immediately below that point in space where, uh, which I've established where the relationships in front of me feel right. So it's the relationships that are critical. That's a wonderful be... description. I mean, you know, th th this, this is what excites me about this conversation is that 45 years have given you an awful lot of time to fine tune your relationship with the tool. Um, that that allows you to record these relationships, but you know the, the fact that they're felt relationships, they're emotional relationships. They're 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 based upon very very limited points in space, uh, as opposed to getting out of a car at a car park and pointing your phone at the three sisters in Glencoe. Uh, you know, the, the, there's some degree of because these perspectives that ultimately then become unique. Um, now, we're going to uh, close the first part of this interview uh, because we, we're going to do it in two parts and, and uh, we're, we're going to change tack a little bit for the second part. Uh, but I just want to say, Joe, that this first part could go on and on and on. And I, I look forward to doing another one of these at some point just so that we can cover huge amounts of the ground that we haven't been able to. But for now, Joe, thank you very much for your incredible insights. And I, I can't wait to get into part two. Pleasure. Thank you, Alistair.